blessings and greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Truly, it's another glorious day in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I trust and pray that God has been faithful to you during our last week. I trust and pray that you are ready to worship God another day, amen. Worship Him for who He is, amen. Not just for the things that He provides and gives to you. But we welcome you to our worship experience here this morning at Mount Olive Baptist Church. And I pray that you will just tune in, that you will be be uplifted this morning, whether it be by a song or by the preached word or just thinking about the goodness of God. Amen. Uh, we want to now have our call to worship. Our call to worship is coming from the 29th Division of Psalms, uh, chapter 1, uh, chapter 29, I'm sorry, verses 1 and 2. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let us pray. Most gracious and all wise Father, once again we thank you for allowing us to come into your holy presence. And Father, we understand that it's been trying times. It's been a long week we need you now more than ever. We ask that you would direct our hearts and our minds towards you and fill us with your spirit. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would just refresh us this morning, Lord God. Renew us. Fill us with your joy and with your peace. Father, you remind us in your holy word that you are faithful to carry all of our burdens. So, Heavenly Father, we pray in every situation, every circumstance, every burden, we bring it to you, Lord God. Because you said that you will renew our strength and you promise to give us rest as we come. Father God, we ask you to forgive us for our shortcomings, Lord God. Forgive us for forgetting our need of you. Forgive us for letting fear and worry control our minds and allowing pride and selfishness to reap harm in our lives. Forgive us, Lord God, for not following your ways and for living distance from your presence. I ask you to bless those who are watching, Lord God. I ask you to continue to give to them the desires of their heart. And Father, we thank you, Lord God, that your ways are far greater than our ways and your thoughts are far deeper than our thoughts. Thank you that you have a plan to save us, a plan to redeem us, Thank you, Father God, that you made all things new. Thank you, Father, that your face is toward the righteous. We thank you that you are close to the broken heart. Lord, I thank you for your daily powerful presence. Now, Lord God, as we're about to go into this worship service, we ask you to clear our minds, Lord God, from any distraction. Help us to be the disciples that you have called us to be. Somebody need you right now, Lord God. As a matter of fact, we all need you, Lord God, to come and just see about us, Lord God. So, Father, we're asking you to stop by, if only for just a little while. Whether we're in this sanctuary, Father, why don't you stop by? Whether we're traveling down the highway, Lord God, why don't you stop by? Whether we're in the comfort of our home, Lord God, we need you to stop by. Because if you stop by, Lord God, we come to realize that everything will be all right. Bless now, Lord God. Bless your people, Lord God. For we declare this day, in the way you bless us, we shall be satisfied. In Christ's name we do pray. 
Amen. At this time, we're going to be led into song by our wonderful praise team. And if you know this song, why don't you just join in with them as they lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
whether we eat or drink, whatever we do, we are to do it in the glory of His name. Amen. 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 I am the wondrous Savior. So I give God glory for redeeming me, for keeping me, for loving me. Even when I mess up, He still loves me. Amen. For we serve a loving and forgiving God. And if God has forgiven you, why don't you take time to give him glory? Amen. You ain't, you ain't always been saved. Amen. You've even now been to save. You're still prone to make mistakes. Amen. So give God glory whenever you have the chance. Thank you, Lord God, for glory. Amen. We want to now have our morning prayer by one of our deacons, our deacon Harrison. It's going to come bless us uh, in prayer. Amen. Amen. Great. Good morning, my all. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. We thank you, O Heavenly Father. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we come to you this morning as humble as we know our God, because you are the author and finish of all of all things. We thank you, O oh God, for your Son, Jesus Christ, who went to Calvary's cross for the sins of the world. And when he said it was finished, he gave up his life and was buried and was crucified on the cross. And he went down to paradise of Abraham bosom to set the captives free. And he came back, O oh grace of God, and went to see Jesus, see God his Father. He is now sitting at his right hand to make intercession for each one of us, because we all need to be saved, because we all have the sin nature, because of Adam and Eve. But we thank you, O oh God, that you said we confess our sin, and he is just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, because we know you are the author and finisher of all our faith. You are the Jehovah Jehovah, the one in three, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit that comes from our heart. So bless us and make us blessing throughout this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen.
I may not have everything I need, but he has given me everything I want. I am so satisfied. When I woke up this morning, I was satisfied. Hey, man, when I laid down last night, I was satisfied. Hey, man, ain't no need to worry what tomorrow is going to bring. Just be satisfied in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He'll make a way out of no way. Hey, Amen. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah.
hear it in my mom and dad is too. You, you really don't know what you do, but, but you really make my job easier as a pastor, amen. As the under shepherd of Mount Island Baptist Church, I'm so grateful for all of you, amen. I'm not going to call names. You know who you are, amen. And I just pray that you will continue to do what God has called you to do as officers and leaders of Mount Island Baptist Church. Praise team, amen.
times. I want to trust. Trust in the Lord because He's worthy. Amen. He's worthy of all honor, glory, and power. And it's only because it was Him who has created everything. Amen. Amen. So will you trust God? Amen. In times when darkness seems to surround you, you don't know which way to go. You're caught between a, a rock and a hard place. Why don't you just trust Him? If you trust Him, amen, you keep your mind on peace. Amen. Thank you, Quiet, for reminding us to, to trust. 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 Proverbs uh, 3 and 5. Trust in the Lord with all, with all thy heart. Amen. Amen. And lean not to your own own understanding. Come amen. On. You shouldn't even have no understanding of your own when it comes to, Come to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. He don't mind thinking for you. He don't mind giving you wisdom. Amen. Amen. That you might walk worthy of your call. Amen. Amen. I'm feeling all right this morning. Amen. It's been a long time to preach. Amen. I'm feeling all right. Right about now, amen, on this communion Sunday, amen, we come to worship God in the beauty of his holiness, amen. There is a word from God on today. I know you at home, I know you're watching by way of social media, but you still should have your, your Bible in hand, amen, so you can see God's word for yourself, amen. And uh, I'm going to be coming from the gospel according to St. Luke uh, chapter 14 uh, verses 25 through 30. Chapter 14, 25 through 30. And it reads, And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said, unto them. If any man come to me and hate not his father, his mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciples. And whosoever doeth not bear his cross, and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sit it not down first and count it the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it. All that behold it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish it. I want to talk to you from the subject, the cost of your cross. The cost of your cross. But before I talk about the cost, of your cross, let me say something about the cause of Calvary's cross. The cross rests on the timeline of history like a compelling diamond. Its tragedy summons all sufferers. Its absurdity attracts all cynics. Its hope lures all searchers. History has idolized the cross and history has despised the cross. History has gold-plated the cross and history has burned the cross. History has worn the cross and history has trashed the cross. History has done everything 
anything to it but ignore it. History may not have fully accepted the cross, but it can't ignore the cross. Because there can be no preaching apart from the cross because the preaching of the cross is the power of God unto salvation. I believe that the only thing that will save this world is the cross of Jesus. So on this day of communion, I pray you know that it is not enough just to know religion. It's not enough to know Christianity. It's not enough to be Baptist, uh, Catholic, uh, Protestant, or uh, Church of God in Christ, it's not enough to know the gifts because nothing will be enough until we know the cause of the cause of the Christ and Christ crucified. I just believe and I know that we are saved through and by the cross of Calvary. I know that at the cross, sin was destroyed. At the cross, Satan was defeated. At the cross, sinners were delivered. And at the cross, salvation was declared. So what is the cause for your cross? Let me digress and admit to you that some of life's lessons are and can be very hard. Uh, for that very reason, King Solomon penned uh, in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6 that we should train up a child. As we continue through this life ordained by Christ, how many of you know that preparation is the key to success? Uh, in life, it's better to know where you are going and what the cause will be before you take one step. Uh, here in our text for today, that's the lesson in this parable told by Jesus Christ. It's better to know where you are going and what the cause will be before you take one step. And at this point in Christ's earthly ministry, the crowds that followed him were continually growing up. It should have been a comfort to him to have so, so many disciples walking with him toward the Holy City. But Jesus was not focused on the presence. He was looking toward the future. He knew that he was on his way down the dusty roads to Jerusalem to die on Calvary's cross. He knew that his throng of enthusiastic followers would soon desert him. Let me ask you, I know you got it going on, but have you deserted Christ lately? Have you? Uh, but he knew his followers would desert him. Christ knew his own disciples would abandon him in his greatest hour of need uh, while he suffered in agony in the garden of Gethsemane. He knew that he would be arrested and placed on trial. And by him being omniscient, all-knowing, he knew that he came to earth to die for our sins. His profound purpose for telling this parable was to warn his followers of the importance of spiritual resolve. Can I tell you that spiritual resolve requires the highest level of determination and tenacity. You will need plenty of spiritual resolve if you desire to be a disciple of and for Jesus Christ. You don't understand it, but disciple can be very uh, difficult. Discipleship can be very difficult. We are called to take up our cross 
and follow Christ without knowing where our journey will take us or even what the cause may be. This parable, known as the parable of the tower builder, is Christ's warning to be prepared like a good soldier in the army of the Lord. Jesus himself made it clear that only cross bearers can be his disciples. The cause of receiving the invitation is one uh, must put Jesus first. Jesus boldly said that the true disciple comes to him without reservation, without hesitation, putting him first. Other relationships are definitely a lower priority than faithfulness and obedience to Jesus Christ. Uh, here in our text for today, I truly heard Jesus when he declared that if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, and hate his own life also, they cannot be my disciple. And if you feel like me, I believe that was an audacious demand. Repeatedly in the Bible we see that Jesus found a way of love and not hate. Yet Jesus used the strong word hate in our text, but he used the strong word hate to show how great the difference must be uh, between our allegiance to him and our allegiance to everyone and everything else. So in a comparative sense and not literally, as a disciple of Christ, you must love him than your own family. You must love him first and your family second. Now, we want to discuss that further in detail, but the question is, how does Jesus Christ prepare us in this parable to face the challenges of being a disciple? Well, there are three things this allegory lays out for our consideration. First, True faith is costly. True faith is costly. To emphasize that discipleship is costly, Jesus uses a strange example. To reiterate, Jesus says that you have to hate your own family, even your own life, in order to be his disciple. Once again on the surface, that seems to be a very cruel statement. But let's take a closer look at his command. First, if a Jew hated his own family, it would have been a violation of the law. Jesus was always admonishing others to fulfill the law. So he could not have meant for us to take his words literally. So Pastor Barnes, what did he really mean? Well, Jesus was placing emphasis on the priority of love. To be loyal to me, Jesus says, I must come before your family. I must come even before you consider your own life. Can I tell you that in the gospel, according to St. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, we find Jesus saying these words. He that loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Believer, you need to understand that discipleship does come at a cost. Imagine for a moment what would happen to the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ if after his crucifixion these disappointed disciples went home to their families and their own livelihoods. In fact, they tried, but Christ followed them to the shore where they were casting their nets and he showed them how important it was for them to be fishers of men. And they immediately dropped their nets 
once more, but this time they followed their calling without looking back. In other words, if you want to follow Jesus, you can't keep looking back because you're taking your eyes off of Christ. If you want to follow Jesus, you got to focus your eyes on Jesus. You know what the word says. We walk by faith and not by sight. So yes, true uh, faith is costly. There may be times when your family will not understand you. There's going to be times when your family is not going to understand your commitment to Jesus Christ. Uh, but when you're committed to Christ, hear me now, your family they'll want to try to discourage you. But if you are a true disciple of Jesus Christ, you will drop your nets You'll drop whatever and follow him. If you are a true disciple of Jesus Christ, you will put him first. Wherever you are tempted to serve God, take care that you do it in the spirit of fellowship with God. As Christ's disciples, make sure that salt is not lacking in your meat offering, God. Your soul must feel a sweet friendship with God or you will never heartily give yourself over to God's service as a disciple of God should be. But can I tell you that as a disciple of Christ, you got to live as though the salt of God's communion is in you every second, God. You got to live in the delightful conviction that God loves you and that God redeemed you and that God owns you. Uh, you got to live as a disciple who is one with Christ. Uh, you, you got to live as a disciple knowing that you are dear to the heart of Jesus Christ. You cannot sing. You cannot pray. You cannot teach a Sunday school lesson. You cannot preach. You cannot minister, you cannot usher, you cannot serve if you lose this salt of communion. Or you may live every now and then, but you can never run for Jesus Christ. You got to have the joy of the Lord in order to serve him fully. Don't you know what the word of God said? The joy of the Lord, it is my strength. Now, I know there's going to be some opposition to your discipleship, but no matter the cause, uh, why don't you thank God for his blessings? Uh, no matter the cause, uh, thank God for the trials uh, and the hardship. No matter the cause, why don't you thank God for the opportunity to serve him? Thank God for allowing you to participate, not in your ministry, but participate in his ministry. Why don't you thank God for the sweetness of salvation, which is God's covenant with you. If you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you have to get up with your mind made up that no matter what God is sending me or what I'm going to deal with today, I'm going to thank God in the house. Second, estimate before you enter. Mm. Once you accept Christ as your Savior, there should be no turning back. So Jesus says it's wise to consider the cost. In allegoric fashion, he says, for which of you intending to build a tower, sit not down first and count the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it. Allow me to rephrase that just a little bit. If you were going to build a house, wouldn't you first sit down and plan the construction? to make sure your heart was in the project. In the parable of the tower, Jesus said, sit down and see if you can afford to follow me. Before you accept the, this cost, sit down and see if you can afford to follow me. Sit down and see if you can afford to refuse my demands. Like a person who does not see the full cost of building a house and suffers ridicule for starting something they cannot finish 
A disciple must understand what it would take to complete the Christian life before making a commitment to Jesus Christ. I ask you all today, will your Christian life be only half built and then abandoned or destroyed because you did not count the cost of real commitment to Jesus Christ? Uh, we need to understand and highlight that following Jesus Christ does not guarantee you a trouble-free life. Uh, it does not guarantee you a free jail, get-out card. Uh, because Christ's calls to discipleship requires us to take some measurements, uh, some assessment of our sincerity and our commitment. Uh, so, so why don't you ask yourself, is my heart in this thing uh, called Christianity? Uh, uh, now that I'm a Christian, uh, can I commit myself to the end? Uh, Ask yourself, have I counted the full cause of discipleship? Huh? If you seek the Lord with all of your heart, uh, will you believe in his word? Uh, will you trust the Savior? Will you forget your past? Uh, will you resist the devil? Uh, and will you keep the faith? Uh, there will be burdens to carry uh, as a discipleship, but the question remains, uh, are you up to it? Uh, there will be lifestyles to change. Uh, are you willing? Uh, there will be temptations to overcome. Uh, will you yield or will you resist? Of course, you will have to build a new life alone. Jesus Christ will be by your side. But some self-assessment is not only necessary, it's essential. Otherwise, you will be just another demon in the church. Uh, 2 Timothy 4 and 10 declares, For demons have forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is now departed. Uh, so I ask you, why don't you estimate the cause before you enter into discipleship for Jesus Christ? Uh, I know things are, 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 these might be some harsh words, uh, uh, but you need to put up or you need to shut up. If you make a claim, you should back it up. Uh, Christ is saying, don't tell me you love me. Show me you love me. Uh, action speaks louder than words. Uh, don't tell me you are a disciple. Show me because a Christian or a disciple is validated by the quality of his or her character. Uh, uh, if Christ has forgiven you, then you forgive others. Uh, if Christ has shown you mercy, why don't you show it to others? Uh, if Christ has strengthened you, uh, then why don't you strengthen somebody else? Uh, if the word has taught you, then teach others. Uh, if God has been patient with you, be patient with others. Uh, if God has blessed you, uh, why don't you bless others? Uh, because if we put up, then the world won't be able to shut us up or shut Christ out. Uh, so why don't you just estimate the cause before you enter into discipleship? Finally, no matter what the cost of your cross, is it worth it? Is it worth it? And the cross, and the cost here, excuse me, and the cost here is crucifixion. Not the crucifixion of your body, but the crucifixion of self. If you want to be a true disciple for Jesus Christ, you got to die to self. The reason why we miss discipling is because self always gets in the way. In other words, the flesh overtakes the spirit. Now understand that when the Roman government crucified a captive, the victim was forced to carry his own cross part of the way to the crucifixion site. Carrying your cross through the streets of the city was supposed to be your confession that you were receiving a just sentence for your sin. That the Roman Empire 
was correct to impose death upon you. It meant that they were right and you was wrong. When Jesus said to his disciples, and whosoever doeth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. What he was really saying is, take up your cross and follow me. Because I am right and they are wrong. Hear me when I tell you that to take up your cross daily is to expect painful situations every day because of your allegiance to Jesus Christ. Let me say again what Jesus is proclaiming. Take up your cross and follow me because I am right and they are wrong. When you're taking up your cross and when it appears that you are under attack, hold on because Jesus knows. When you are assaulted by adversaries, stay in the race because Jesus knows. When you're confronted by calamity, hang on in there because Jesus knows. When you're ripped by, by rivals, don't quit. Continue to carry your cross because Jesus knows. No matter the cost of your Christ, your cross, excuse me, it is worth it. So keep the faith. As a disciple, your faith doesn't falter when money is low. Your faith doesn't falter when times get tough. Your faith doesn't falter when patience is stretched. Your faith doesn't falter when the enemies surround you. As Christians, as disciples, we are called to follow Christ with and in faith to our death. This is just what the religious leaders of ancient times refused to do. It was too great a cause for them to bear. They could not follow Christ because they could not give up power, prestige, and position. You all know anybody like that in the church? Want to be in charge of everything? Amen? Think they know it all? Operate in everybody else's lane instead of staying in their own lane? Don't want to give up their power? But you have no power. All power comes from Jesus Christ. All power belongs to God. The cross of self-denial was too heavy for the religious leaders of Christ's time to carry. But that's the cause of discipleship. We got to relinquish all we have and become humble unto Jesus Christ in order to become his disciples. And it's worth it because the Apostle Paul writes in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Listen, if you will. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Saints of the true living God, I don't know the full cost of your cross. You may have lost some old friends or even family who just couldn't accept the change in you. At times your cross may seem cruel and your load may seem too heavy to bear. Your cross can be those daily struggles of life, the boss that acts crazy, the sickness of the body, the mountains of debt, the broken relationship, the wrong relationship, the betrayal by your friends, uh, the nuisance of those who chose choose to claim the position of the enemy. I don't know the cause of your cross. Maybe it's your inability to live up to all that you should be. Your yielding to temptation. Your falling outside the will of God. The many ways that we sin by the world, thought and deed, basically our wars within the flesh. 
I don't know the cost of your cross. Maybe your cross represents your obligation to serve God. Uh, maybe the cross represents the assignments and purposes that God has placed in your heart, the burden of fulfilling that thing which God has spoken into your spirit. But no matter which cross represents or fit your life, the reality is that each one of us has a cross. The challenge may seem too large and the task may seem too great, but don't be discouraged. It's worth it and I know it. I know it's a challenge to keep going when everybody else is stopping, but it's worth it to carry the cross. I know it's a challenge to hold on when the rest are letting go, but it's worth it. I know it's a challenge to stand firm when others are stumbling and staggering, but it's worth it. I know it's a challenge to rely on God when others are denying God, but it's worth it. It's worth it because Christ is worth it. It's worth it because Christ died that you might live forever. Yet Christ is worth the cost of your Christ because he alone has the power to be your protector and your provider. If you don't know by now, Christ can refresh you when you are weary because he is the fountain of living water. He can nourish you when you're feeling feeble because he is the true vine. He can calm your calamity because I found out him to be the Prince of Peace. He can lift you from the state of depression because he's your burden bearer. He can lift you from anything because he's everything. He created everything. And you'll never feel lost because he is the good shepherd. He's the bright and morning star. He'll guide you. He's the captain of your salvation. He'll help you carry your cross. The Lord has chosen in the pit. He'll help you. The Lord has Daniel in the lion's den. He'll help you. The Lord has Samson in the king's palace. He'll help you. The Lord has Jeremiah under the juniper tree. He'll help you. The Lord has his only begotten sons carry his cross. And he'll help you. So no matter what the cause to carry your cross, it will pay off in the shadow of Christ's cross. So God begs you, take up your cross and follow me, God. I heard a song by the say, but Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free God. No, there is a cross for everyone and there is a cross for me. There's comfort in carrying the cross of your cross because Jesus is right there. There's conciliation, there's consummation in carrying so don't just toss your cross aside. What if Jesus had tossed his cross aside? They whipped him all night long. They humiliated him. They spit on him. They beat him half death. But he still managed to carry his cross. He carried his cross because he knew what the end was going to be. So I admonish you to take up your cross daily and follow God that you might be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. We're living in a time where we really need real folk. We need true disciples of Jesus Christ. So don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Keep the faith. Hang in there. And carry your cross. And when you get tired and you can't carry it no more, say, Lord God, I need you. I need you to come and help me to bear my cross. And he will be at your back in the side. That's the kind of God we serve. So, what is the cause of your cross? Not to ever, ever abandon it. Amen. I want to open up, send out an invitation for those who are in need of saving. This is the 
most significant, the most critical part of service. I know that the, the giving of our tithes and offerings is, is great, but this call to salvation is the most significant part of any worship experience. I'm sending out a call to those who don't have a relationship or an intimate relationship with Christ. That if you don't know him in the midst of your sins, that you will confess him as Lord and Savior. I trust that you will look back to the works, the finished works of the cross of Calvary. Where Jesus paid it all. Where he gave his life that you might have a right. The Bible declares that you must confess him as Lord, Lord of Lords. You must believe in him. You must believe that he died and that he rose. Being saved is not based on feelings. It's based on believing. Believing that Christ died for your sin. If you would just open up your heart and just receive him, ask him to come into your heart, he will. To change your mindset, to change the way you think, to change the way you act. Now is a good time. Why? Because today is not promised to you, amen. The next second is not promised. And if you were to die right now, do you really know where you're going? If you don't have an inclination of where you're going, well, you might have an inclination, but if you don't have a true inclination that you're going to heaven, then this invitation is just for you. Why don't you admit to God that you are a sinner in need of saving grace? And Christ will come and save you. So, Lord God, I'm a sinner standing in need of salvation. I believe, Heavenly Father, that you died. I believe that you rose on the third day, that I might have eternal life. Come into my heart. Accept me, Lord God, just as I am. Clean me up, Lord God, that I might be a true disciple for you. If you just prayed that prayer and you believe it in your heart, then you are saved. I trust that you will find yourself in a Bible-based church where they're teaching sound doctrine and helping you to mature in God's holy word. Amen? Amen. Truly, God has been good to all of us. Amen? But now is the time for our holy community. Amen? I'm going to reach down here and get me a wafer or cracker. Amen? As we partake in our holy communion. And I pray that you don't take communion lightly, amen. Uh, communion was ordained by Jesus Christ himself. It's a time where we reflect and remember that great sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So as you partake of this holy communion, I pray that you will just focus or reflect on things in your life where you can improve, amen? That you might become a better disciple of Jesus Christ. Unlike baptism where you get baptized once a week, we commune every, every month, amen? Because the greatest sacrifice that Christ ever provided to mankind was the sacrifice of his life. He loved you that much that he died on Calvary's cross, that you might have a right to eternal life. So therefore that night in the upper room, Jesus was with his disciples, and he knew one of them was going to betray him. And he told the one to go betray him because he must finish the work of the one who sent him. The Bible said that he blessed the bread, he 
He broke it and gave it unto his disciples. And told them to eat all of it. For this is my body which was broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let us all eat together. The same night he, he took the cup. He blessed it and gave it to his disciples and told them to drink all of it. For this is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for the remissions of sins. He said, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine till I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us all drink together. Amen. Amen. Can we just have some, some music played by our musician at this time? As we're about to close out this service. Hallelujah. And I, I know God has been more than good to you. Amen. In spite of our current situation, I just admonish you to hold on. Hang in there. I also want to tell the, the DDTs, the deacons, the deaconess and the trustees that we will be having a meeting uh, here at the church uh, Saturday, uh, which I believe is the 13th. Am I, am I right about it? Saturday the 13th. Yes. Amen. At 1 p.m. I pray that you can make it out. If not, you can uh, join us uh, via Zoom. But we will have a meeting at 1 p.m. here at Mount Island Baptist Church uh, Saturday, March 13th. And uh, we also know that's the time when we spring forward. Amen. Uh, that weekend as well. So uh, I pray that you will just govern yourselves accordingly, that you will make time to attend this meeting, amen, because we have some things we need to address, some things we need to talk about, that we can continue to move forward in the kingdom of God, amen. I just want to thank you all for tuning in. I pray that God's word uh, has nourished you, refreshed you, I pray that you will hold on, hold on to every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Let us look to be healed from which coming our help. Our help come from God, the maker of heaven and earth. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, for your grace and we thank you for your mercy. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have called us, that you have chosen us to be your disciples. And Lord God, we pray that you will give us the strength and the wisdom to be what you have called us to be. I ask for your continual blessings upon uh, Mount Olive Baptist Church, uh, churches throughout this great world, Lord God. I pray that you will continue to guide us, Lord God. Give us purpose in life, Heavenly Father, uh, that we might continue to stay on the narrow path. We love you, Father God. We honor you. And we just praise you, Heavenly Father, simply because of who you are. Now, may the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory forever and ever. And the people of God said, Amen. Go in peace, and may the Lord God bless you real good.